And, and it boils down to you know these um, these qualitative differences that really are not going to be patched between what today we might refer to as anarchists and communists. But at the time, <coughs> um, terms that were uh, they kind of identified as agrarian socialists sometimes versus um, Marxist influence, which was coming into Russia and was seen as um, scientific communism for the industrial classes. And sometimes these differences were differences of emphasis, and sometimes, like I said, they were just you know, pure uh, qualitative differences that weren't going to be resolved. Um, the first type, um, the agrarian socialists, were the older um, tendency. Uh, chronologically speaking, they were the longer and the older tendency within Russian revolutionaries. and. Um, they emphasize the peasantry's customs of communal welfare, collective responsibility, and cooperation at work and at leisure should be the foundations for the good society. Um, these new young upstart industrial, um, these revolution, revolutionaries that would emphasize the industrial nature of class uh, warfare and the um, and Marx's scientific analysis. Um, this is a quote from a service, uh, found through bitter experience that workers were more responsible, responsive to revolutionary invocations than were the peasants. For instance, when a surge of students went out to affect revolutionary propaganda in the countryside in 1874, many of them had been turned over to the Ministry of Interior by astonished peasants, end quote. Um, and so part of this debate comes down to a debate of efficacy and which um, class is going to be more responsive uh, to the aims. Um, <clears throat> let me skip the part here just for a second. Okay. Some of this infighting, though, between the so-called agrarian uh, socialists and uh, those uh, Marxists. Um, became so pronounced. Uh, Lenin had a friend um, that shot himself, actually, because uh, the hyperbole between the two groups grew so intense that he felt like his reputation was, was slandered so much beyond repair that he, he uh, could no longer live up to the expectations of his comrades, and he shot himself, and this affected Lenin. Um, there's a character uh, named Plenkinov, which I'm going to talk more about in the second lecture. Um, he'll, come, he'll come in to be, uh, I'll talk more about him in the second lecture, but I'll talk a little bit about him right here, actually. And he figured prominently in this debate between the agrarian socialists and the Marxists. <clears throat> Build anticipation when I do this. <laughs> uh, just, yes. just frustration. Okay. Um, so, uh, jo uh, Plankinov maintained that the future of the revolution did not realistically lie with the peasant, the land, co the land commune, and the, con and the countryside. Plankinov was a lapsed agrarian socialist. He became a convert to uh, Marxism. Uh, although he and Marx are going to have their differences later on, which I'll go into in a second. Uh, he urged that success could no longer be achieved, and achieved unless the clandestine groups recognized that Russia was undergoing an economic and social transformation. And this becomes a really important point of departure because, um, as you guys all know, Russia is economically and industrially uh, much further behind than Western Europe. Um, so hold on to that thought for a second. Um, <clears throat> railways were being laid to connect all the major cities. Factories were being financed and constructed. Mines were being sunk. Foreign investment was being attracted into the country in pursuit of the quick, high profits available in an, in an economy rich in natural resources and cheap, willing labor. It was no longer feasible, wrote Plankinov, to dream of transforming Russia into a socialist society without at first undergoing the stage of capitalist development. Capitalism, he declared, had already arrived and had arrived in force. So this becomes a key component of this debate. Um, <clears throat> some are arguing, on the one hand, that Russia can can actually skip right over capitalism. Um, others are arguing that that's just you know, farcical and impossible, and we have to utilize capitalism as a, 
uh, stage in development on our way to socialism or communism. This becomes a key point, and one that Lenin will weigh in on uh, later on. And I'll, actually, I'll come back to that in a second. <clears throat> Um, there was much controversy among the revolutionaries of the Re Russian Empire as to whether Plenkinov had got it right that we did <coughs> that capitalism had in fact already arrived in Russia in force, and that we had to deal with it. There was no sense in going back to a utopian or idealized agrarian socialist society that we had to implement capitalism <coughs> as a tool. Um, in 1881, Vera Zasuluk. Uh, the agrarian socialist terrorist wrote to Marx himself asking whether he believed that the scheme of social development he had sketched out for the advanced capitalist states was necessarily applicable to agrarian Russia. And so this is a, a point of contention as Marx is being translated into Russian. People are asking, um, is his formula uh, categorical in all societies or you know, taking into account uh, different stages of development, could um, could we uh, possibly skip the stage of capitalism? Um, <clears throat> in many of his works, Marx had analyzed how the capitalist stage came from the bowels of feudalism. So feudalism led to capitalism. He predicted that the internal process of capitalism would engender crisis after crisis, which in turn would induce the impoverished working class equipped by capitalism itself with educational and organizational skills to seize power. So that was the standard interpretation by many was that capitalism was necessary. Thus the movement from feudalism to capitalism to socialism was not only desirable, it was inevitable. But asked Vera Zasuluk, was the sequence of stages predestined to affect every country? Might there not be a chance for a largely pre-capitalist country such as Russia to avoid capitalism altogether and to adopt socialism. <clears throat> the reply she received from Marx was gratifying. Far from claiming that capital offered a template for all countries, he accepted that Russia's agrarian economy and peasant communal traditions might allow it to have a socialist transformation without capitalist industrialization. Um, and so in the polemics of the time, uh, the apologists for both camps were, were using this uh, to advance, uh, you know, the agrarian socialists are saying, even Marx supports us, which is probably taking it a little bit far. But thus he appeared to condone the strategy of the Russian agrarian socialists. And indeed, he and Engels were also known to admire the anti czarist terrorists and to dismiss the self proclaimed Marxists, such as Plankinov, as bookish and cowardly. This is another point of contention among many of the, the Marxists and the agrarian socialists, as many of the agrarian socialists advocate uh, terrorism, and many of the Marxists at the time are advocating. organizing. Um, thus the Russian controversy over capitalism between the agrarian socialists and the Marxists seemingly encouraged Marx to side with the agrarian socialists. Um, but Marx was not quite so unequivocal as Zasulik claimed on the possibility of a socialist revolution being based on the egalitarian aspect of peasant land commune. He had specified that this would not be at all practical unless there were concurrent seizures of power by socialist parties in the advanced capitalist countries of the West. Meaning, um, at first glance, it appears that he's uh, siding with the agrarian um, socialists. However, he makes the point that they're only going to be able to maintain that <clears throat> way of lifestyle in Russia if the other industrialized countries who already are processing capitalism are going to stand in international solidarity with them. And so at some point, you have to be complicit with capitalism. Um, and I will leave it at that for right now. So that is the kind of milieu that um, Vladimir's older brother Alexander goes away to college in. And unbeknownst to his, his uh, middle class parents, Alexander takes up with revolutionaries in college and becomes uh, barely unrecognizable. And um, <clears throat> he, um, they plot the assassination of the Tsar. Uh, 